The following sermon by Jonathan Edwards is called A Man May Eternally Undo Himself in One Thought of His Heart. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps a thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 8, 20 to 22. Those are the words of the Apostle Peter to Simon the Sorcerer, who, being a person of an exceeding haughty and ambitious spirit, had, before Philip and the Apostles came there, given out that he was some great one, and pretended to be the great power of God, and had bewitched the people with sorcery, so that they almost worshipped him as a god among them. But when the people were converted to Christianity by the preaching of Philip and the Apostles, he, observing that through the laying on of the Apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given in the extraordinary and miraculous gifts of it, he seems to have thought that if he could but be possessed of the same power, that on whomsoever he laid his hands they might receive the Holy Ghost, that then he should be under advantages still to maintain the same ascendant over the people that he had hitherto held, and still be accounted some great one amongst them as he used to be, and therefore offered the apostles money, as verses 18 and 19, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Upon which Peter says to him, as in the text, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 8, 20-22 in which may be observed, number one, of what kind is the crime that Simon here is blamed for, namely, a wicked thought of his heart. There are three kinds of actual sin, namely, sins of thought, and sins of word, and sins of deed. Simon's sin that is here had spoken was of the former sort. It was a sin of thought. Number two, the particular wicked thought that he was guilty of, namely, that he thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. So dishonorable and vile a thought did he entertain of God that he imagined he could have purchased the Holy Ghost, one of the persons of the Blessed Trinity, to have him at his disposal to give to whom he would for his money. Number three, what this sin was as an evidence of namely, that he was in a natural condition. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Number four, what this sin did imminently expose him to, namely, to eternal perdition, as is implied in these words of the apostle, thy money perish with thee. I.e., keep thy money to thyself, and as thou art in danger of perishing, your money shall remain with you and perish with you before we will take any money from you on any such account. Number five, we may observe how the apostle exhorts him to seek for forgiveness. Repent of this thy wickedness and pray God. Six, and lastly, the uncertainty of his obtaining it, if he should so do. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, which implies that though there was a possibility of it, yet there was a great uncertainty. He appeared by this sin that he had been guilty of to be in imminent danger of perishing eternally. He had that guilt on himself that it was very uncertain whether ever it would be removed. Doctrine. A man may be eternally undone in one thought of his heart. This point may be cleared by the consideration of the following things. Number one. Any one act of sin by the law exposes to eternal perdition though it should proceed no further than the thought of the heart. Tis said in Ezekiel 18.20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. We are told in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. By death is meant a death of the whole man, and not only the death of the body. Tis a total destruction of the sinner that is intended, and that the apostle means eternal death is evident from the antithesis in the words or the opposing of this death to the life which we are told in the next words is the gift of God, 
which the apostle says is eternal life. And when it is said that tis its wages, the meaning of it is that it is that recompense it deserves and the recompense that is appointed and stated. It is not only intended that it is the wages of a wicked life or sinful course, but of any one thing that is a sin or a breaking of the divine law, as is evident by those texts in Genesis 2.14. In the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. It is not a course of sin, but an act of sin that is here spoken of. And the same words are applicable to any other act of sin. The law threatens death to them that break the law. But the apostle tells us in James 2 verse 10, that he that offends in one point is guilty of all, and the curse is denounced against them that do in anything fail of fulfilling the law. Galatians 3 verse 10. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things, found written in the book of the law to do them. And not only great acts of rebellion are called sin, and reputed breaches of God's law in Scripture, but evil thoughts. Proverbs 24 verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. Any one wicked exercise of the heart is, in the sight of God, a breach of his laws. In the fifth of Matthew, 28th verse, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so, in the 22nd verse of the same chapter, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Number two, God sometimes punishes sin by forever leaving men in sin. God sometimes leaves men to commit more sin as a punishment of the sins they have already committed, when he doesn't leave them forever in sin. So it seems to have been with David when he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. It was a just and righteous thing with God to leave him to commit murder as he did soon after. And when he was left so to do, he had cause to reflect on himself and consider how justly he had been provoked to leave him as he did to it but yet he was not finally left in sin. But God does sometimes leave men in sin as the punishment of the sin they have been guilty of. He forever withholds from them that influence of his Holy Spirit that is necessary in order to their being brought out of a sinful state. So it was with Ephraim of old, Hosea 4.17, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. This is a punishment that sin deserves for men by sinning against God to deserve that God should withdraw from them. Men in sinning act a part of enemies to God, and by so doing they therefore deserve that God should act a part of an enemy to them. And therefore they deserve that he should leave them or depart from them. Enemies are not disposed to dwell together. Amos 3 verse 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? If sinners, therefore, won't agree with God, but will do the part of enemies to him, they deserve that God should refuse to be with them, and that he should forever depart from them. But herein they will be left forever in sin. This punishment is included in the threatenings of the law, for that threatens death. A being left of God in sin is only a being left in spiritual death. God sometimes punishes the wickedness that men have been guilty of by forever withholding from them converting and saving grace. He leaves them forever in blindness of mind. Isaiah 6, 9 and 10 Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Therein did the great punishment of their sin that is here spoken of consist that God had determined that God would forever withhold converting grace from them, whereby their souls might be healed. There are different degrees in which God may leave persons that he punishes by forever withholding his converting grace from them. Some he in his sovereignty continues under means of grace or under some strivings of the spirit so as to put them upon seeking conversion, and yet he punishes their sins by forever denying them success to those persons and to their seeking. Thus Peter supposes it might be with Simon the sorcerer that he might pray God for forgiveness, and yet that God might in anger for his wickedness refuse ever to forgive him. 
That was but a perhaps in the case. It was uncertain whether he would or not. So it seems to be supposed in Hebrews 12:16 to 17 that some may seek repentance and pardon carefully and with tears, and yet God may forever withhold it from them in wrath for their selling the heavenly inheritance, as it were, for a morsel or meat, or a short gratification of some lust, which may be done either in thought or in act. Sometimes God utterly leaves them in security and never gives them any more strivings of his spirit. He gives them up to go on in ways of allowed wickedness. This seems to be what is intended in Psalm 81, 11, and 12. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts' lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Some are given up and abandoned to gross wickedness, to dishonor themselves exceedingly, so as to become infamous. So it was with them in Romans 1, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And the 26th verse, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. And sometimes God even takes away the means of grace and leaves persons to renounce even the very profession of religion and leaves them to this forever. So it was with the Jews that we read of in the 44th of Jeremiah, verses 25 and 26. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. You will surely accomplish your vows, and surely perform your vows. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall be no more named in the mouth of any man of Judah, in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. There seems to have been different degrees of God's forsaking and giving up the Jews as a people that lived in and after Christ's time. They were so left even while Christ lived among them and continued to preach and work miracles among them that this punishment was denounced against the body of the people that God would forever withhold converting grace from them as appears by Matthew 13, 13, 14, and 15. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. It should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But yet they seem to be left and given up in a yet a further degree, when Christ was put to death, as appeared by what Christ said when he was going up to Jerusalem to be crucified there, Luke nineteen forty one and 42. And when he was come near, he beheld a city and wept over it, saying, If you had known even you, at least in this your day, the sayings which belong unto your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. But yet the apostle preached to them, and used many means with that nation after this. And that nation seemed to be given up in a yet further degree at the time of their destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Romans, when there was heard a voice in the Holy of Holies, as the history of that affair relates, saying, Let us go home. Then the presence of God did most remarkably go from them, and they were totally cast off from all visibility of being a people of God. Number three. God exercises his sovereignty with respect to the number and degree of sins by which he will be provoked thus to deal with persons. It is true that the greatest sinners do most expose themselves to a being thus eternally left of God. They that contract the greatest guilt, the sin the most aggravatedly do, bring themselves into the most imminent danger of having God swear in his wrath that they shall never enter into his rest. But yet it is not always they that have committed the most sins or those that have committed the greatest and most aggravated sins that are given up to sin. 
In some, God bears with much greater sins than in others and doesn't finally leave them. In some, God is pleased to wait a great deal longer upon than others before he everlastingly forsakes them. God is sovereign in this manner and will act as such. Some he gives up to sin in youth, and others he waits upon till old age and confers him at last. Some exceeding great sinners and heinously wicked men are brought to repentance, while others that committed, it may be, not half nor a quarter of their sins, do perish forever, and are eternally cast off of God. Some of the Jews were converted that imbued their hands in Christ's blood, that with their own hands maliciously murdered him. But the bulk of that nation were eternally given up of God, that greater part of which had no immediate hand in such a horrible feat. And we have no reason to think had ever made them near so guilty as they had done. There were many that were forever left in unbelief among the Jews without doubt that never had made themselves so guilty as the Apostle Paul. And yet he was not only converted, but most miraculously converted, and made one of the most eminent saints that ever was, and had the greatest honor put upon him by God, was the only saint that was admitted into the third heavens while he yet continued in a mortal state, and seems to have been the very greatest instrument of good to the world that ever was of any mere man. And yet by his own account he seems to have exceeded most in a zeal against the true religion, and in persecution and cruelty towards the professors of it. Galatians 1, 13 and 14 For you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And he seems to be spoken of in the Acts as one of the greatest of persecutors. We have an account of sins that David committed that were upon many accounts, at least, much greater than those sins that Saul was guilty of, that are mentioned as what provoked God finally to leave him, such as his sparing Agag and the best of the sheep and oxen, and his offering a burnt offering. God's sovereignty determines the measure of the day of his patience. He will wait on some, but a very little while, and on others he is pleased to wait long. With some persons God will deal in severity, and with others he will exercise great good on and exceed in long suffering and forbearance. Romans 11.22 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall also be cut off. Every sin, as we have observed already, deserves the penalty of the law, which is death, and the curse of God in this life, and that which is to come. Therefore every particular sin, and even every sin of thought, deserves this curse, namely, of being eternally left of God, to continue in sin, and to perish at last. If it were so that there were any man that never committed but one sin, God is not bound to such a man not to inflict his punishment for, namely, eternally to leave him without repentance and pardon. God has reserved his sovereignty to himself in this matter. He remains arbitrary and will act as such. He is not bound by one absolute promise to any one sinner whether he has committed fewer sins or more sins either to bestow any mercy on him or not to inflict any rods of punishment on him. The fallen angels were eternally forsaken of God as soon as they had committed one sin. And though God offers mercy to fallen men and commonly bears with multitudes of sins in them before he finally casts them off, yet with respect to the manner, he is arbitrary and does according to his good pleasure. Number four. When God is provoked by a man's sins finally to leave him and give him up to perdition, there is ever more someone's sin that puts an end to God's patience. When God bears with the sinner as he goes on in a course of sinning against him, and at last is provoked eternally to forsake him, there is someone's sin that is the last sin that God will bear with before it comes to this. God will bear with sinners to such a certain limited degree in sinning and no longer. God has determined the bounds, Genesis 6, verse 3. 
My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And therefore, when God finally departs from a man to leave him to himself, there is a certain limit that this judgment commences from when a sin comes to such a pass. And there, therefore, must be a last sin, and that does a finishing stroke towards bringing his guilt up to those bounds. There is a certain sin that is a sin that ends God's patience, or that puts a man beyond the bounds and limits of God's forbearance towards him. And therefore a man may be said to have eternally undone himself in that sin. That sin is a sin that does, as it were, dispatch him. It gives his soul the finishing stab. And sometimes after this God does immediately send some mortal sickness or accident to take the man out of the world, that he may speedily be cast into hell. And sometimes God suffers them to live longer as to fill up the measure of their sin. That wicked thought of heart that we read of in the text in Simon the Sorcerer was probably the sin that gave the finishing stroke towards provoking God finally to leave him and give him up. The apostles intimate that there was a great danger of it, and it probably was so, for we never read of his being brought to any good, and by the accounts that ecclesiastical history gives of him, he was after this a most notorious ringleader in wickedness that most of those vile heresies that infested the primitive church had their rise from him. Number five. God is sovereign in determining what sin that shall be. He not only determines how long he will bear with sinners, or how many sins or what degree of guilt he will bear with before he leaves men, but he determines what the sin shall be. We can't conclude that the sin that ends God's patience or that it is the last sin that God will bear with before he will give a person up to sin and destruction, is the greatest sin. It is probable that tis commonly, if not always, some willful sin, some sin wherein a spirit of contempt of God does appear, or some sin in which the spirit of God is especially grieved. But it is not always the greatest sin, though it be true that the greater the sin, the more does it expose to it and bring into danger of it. And God is sovereign, whether the sin shall be a sin of the thought or a sin of the behavior, as in Simon the sorcerer, it was probably a sin of thought. Sins of thought only are in several respects lesser sins than others. The guilt is not so great as when, besides the imagination of the heart, the wicked thought brings forth fruit in some overt act of wickedness. When sin remains only in the thought, then, it remains only, as it were, in a state of its first conception, but when it proceeds to act, it is not only conceived, but brought forth, James 1, verse 15. Number 6. One particular act of sin may be that by which God may be especially provoked forever to leave persons to perish, either soon to take away their lives and to send them to hell, or else to leave them and forever to withhold from them, converting and pardoning grace. Not only may a particular act of sin be the last sin that God will bear with before he is provoked forever to leave a person, but it may be especially by that act of sin that he is provoked forever to leave them. This judgment may be brought on a person more especially as a punishment of that sin. Simon the sorcerer had been an exceeding wicked man before this wicked thought of heart. He had committed great and high-handed wickedness, for he was a wizard. It is said that he had bewitched the people with sorceries, and it seems he had been a false prophet. He pretended to speak and to do what he did as being sent of God, and as acting under a divine influence when God had not sent him, and he did nothing but dissemble and lie. And he wickedly pretended to be the great power of God, as in the tense verse of the context. He did, in a sort, set up himself to be a god or to be a divine person, endowed with divine attributes, particularly attributes of God's power. How vile and blasphemous was he herein! But yet it was not with a special regard to those sins that he seems to have been eternally given up and forsaken of God, but it was principally with regard to that wicked thought of his heart that the gift of God should be purchased with money, 
and therefore the apostles who knew his case to especially intimate danger from his sin, and to especially direct him to pray to God if perhaps the thought of his heart might be forgiven him. And so Saul had been a wicked man all his days, but yet it was with a special respect to that sin of his sparing the best of the sheep and oxen that God seems finally to have left him, as for Samuel fifteen sixteen to 19 Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And soon after this we read that God took away his spirit from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him, 1 Samuel 16.14. And so he continued till the day of his death. Number 7. That sin by which God is especially provoked to leave a person eternally to perish may be only a thought of the heart. We can't conclude that it is always the greatest sin, for God exercises his sovereignty as to this matter also. Though he exercises his wisdom, and tis probable there is commonly something peculiarly aggravating in circumstances, some act or word or wicked thought that, considering all things and all God's foregoing dealings, their present advantages and obligations, is that which especially tends to provoke God to cast them off forever. But we can't determine what sin it will be. Persons may eternally undo themselves by sins that they look upon as small. Simon the sorcerer seems not to have thought it any great evil in his thought when he proposed it to the apostles and offered them money, but was very bold and open in it. He did not seem to expect any such rebuke as he met with. It was a sin attended with peculiar aggravations, but yet he had probably committed many other sins more against the dictates of his own conscience. But this in all probability was that which in an especial manner was a sin that eternally undid him. Application number one. The first use may be made of instruction. From this doctrine we may learn how exceeding great the punishment of ungodly men is like to be. If one wicked thought of the heart be sufficient to merit that God should be so provoked with him that is guilty of it, as forever to leave him to himself, and either immediately to cut himself off and cast him into hell, or to leave him in sin and give him up to hardness of heart and blindness of mind, and follow him with his curse as long as he lives, and to cast him at last into hell fire, and therefore to deprive him of all good and make him perfectly miserable, and that to all eternity without any hope or possibility of deliverance. And all this may actually be brought on a person for some one act of sin, and that is sin only in the thought of the heart, then to what misery are they exposed that have lived a considerable time in the world and have never done anything else but sin all the days of their lives? For how vast is the number of the sins of such? How many thousands and thousands of sins have they been guilty of, any one of which singly are sufficient to bring that everlasting destruction upon them? If one wicked thought deserves and exposes to so much, how much do all those deserve and expose to? And how dreadful will their case be if they never get an interest in Christ while they live, and so go to hell at last? How dreadful will it appear that their punishment will be when we consider this, that God will execute upon them the full punishment that all their sins deserve? For we are taught that God will exact of sinners the whole of the debt that they owe to divine justice. Matthew 18, verse 34. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him, and that God won't release them of one farthing. Matthew 5, verse 26. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the last farthing. 
And it must needs be so, for if God did not exact the whole of the debt, then he forgives some of it. And if unbelievers have any part of the debt forgiven them, then there is forgiveness out of Christ. Hence how many thousands and ten thousands of deaths and destructions will a wicked man, as it were, endure, that has spent a life in sin in this world? Men's sins will be punished according to their heinousness, appears by that in Matthew 5.22, But I say unto you that every one who is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of the hell of fire. The judgment and the council were different tribunals among the Jews that had power to inflict death or capital punishments of different degrees. The one had power of inflicting a more dreadful death than the other. The judgment had power to inflict death by the sword. The council had power to inflict death by crucifixion. But the punishment of hellfire, in which Christ alludes to the burning of children to Molech in the valley, was the most dreadful death of all that persons were wont to be put to among the Jews, so that by those three are signified different degrees of punishment in hell according to the heinousness of men's sins. And that men's sins will be punished according to their aggravations is evident by that in Luke twelve forty seven and 48. That servant who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. And that men will be punished according to the multitude and repetition of their sins, it appears by Matthew twelve thirty six and 37. For every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. If men must account for every idle word, then they must pay for every idle word. That is, they must suffer the punishment of every idle word. And therefore, if one sin brings death or eternal destruction, two will bring what is equivalent to two such deaths, or an eternal destruction twice as bad, and a thousand will bring that which is equivalent to a thousand such destructions. So Hosea 7 verse 2, They consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own dealings have beset them about, they are before my face. God remembers them all because he will punish them all. And God will make them hereafter all to beset them about and lay hold on them as so many vipers or lions roaring on their prey. So Hosea 8 verse 13, He will remember their iniquity and visit their sins. And so Ezekiel 7 verse 3, I will judge thee according to thy ways, and recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And so Leviticus 26 18, And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 21, And if ye will walk contrary to me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And so verses 24 and 28. And because the punishment and wrath that wicked men shall endure shall be according to the number of their sins, therefore wicked men, while they are going on in sin, are said to be treasuring up wrath against a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans 2 verse 5. Let those that are yet in an unconverted state and condition consider these things. Consider seriously how dreadful your punishment must and will be if you don't get an interest in Christ. You cannot answer for one of a thousand of your sins, nor can you bear the punishment of one of a thousand. The punishment of one wicked thought will be too much for you. It will sink you and crush you. You can't bear up under it, nor in any wise grapple with it. One act of sin, though only in the thought, if unrepented of, will blow up a flame of wrath that will be enough to fill you all over full of fire, so that your bowels, your head, and your heart, and lungs, your tongues, bones, and nerves, and sinews, veins, and arteries, will be all full of hell fire, and this to all eternity. What then do you think to do with all the punishment of all your great and aggravated sins? Your sins against so much light and such warnings. Your sins against the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ when they all encompass you about and come upon you together. 
How does a man that is under strong bodily pain by any disease or wound, by a broken bone or some such thing, when he has already as much pain as he can well grapple with, how does he dread to have it increased? How does the least addition to it by touching the tender place or stirring the wounded limb make him ready to roar out because he had as much pain before as he could endure? How then will you do in hell when the punishment of one sin alone will be so much more than you can bear as to be enough utterly to destroy you? How then will you do when you won't only have a little added to that but will have it multiplied ten thousand times? Now you make light of sin, but then you won't make light of it. You will then find the least sin to be a mountain, and that it lies on your soul like the weight of a mountain. And you will be then willing, if it were possible, to give ten thousand worlds to have so much as the punishment of one sin taken off, though you will have the punishment of so many thousands to endure. How does a wicked rich man plead for one drop of water to cool his tongue? A little good would that do him to have the pain of his tongue a little cooled when he was all over in every part within and without full of the tormenting flame. But this shows how the damned will wish for the least abatement of their torment. You never yet felt hell torments. If you had, you would not hear of it and think of it and expose yourself to it with such quietness. If you had only felt the punishment due to one sinful thought for one half hour, it would give you other ideas about hell than what you now have. You would not be able to keep from reflecting on the number of your sins. And though now you don't much mind adding to the score of additional sins, yet then you would count it a great privilege to have your sins one less than they be. The damned in hell would be ready to give worlds, if they could, to have the number of their sins to have been by one less to have one idle word or sinful thought forgotten and blotted out, and to be released from the punishment of it. Now it may be you may be ready to think that if you are cast into hell, where you must endure the punishment of so many thousand sins, that the addition of a few sins will make no great addition. It weren't worth regarding among such a multitude, but then you will be of another mind, when not a man that is of a tormenting and a fire, Dread to have his torment increased? Would when he was already more than he could endure, would he by any means have it in the least increased? Would he not rather beg to have it a little abated? Let these things be seriously considered by those that are out of Christ, and stir them up to improve their time while they are yet out of hell, to fly from the wrath to come, and to obtain the pardon of all their sins through Christ through whom they may be released from the whole dead and have eternal life. Number two. If it be so that a man may eternally undo himself with one thought of his heart, to what degree do they expose themselves to destruction that do allowedly go on in a wicked course of life? If a man exposes himself to be eternally undone by one single act of wickedness, and even one wicked thought of heart, how they expose themselves that are continually day after day, allowing themselves in continuous and repeated acts of wickedness that make sin their trade, that though are taught from their childhood what the commandments of God be, and come to meeting Sabbath after Sabbath, and hear what God requires of them, and yet in the continued course of their lives go headlong against it. They are solemnly warned in the name of God against these and those sins, and yet do them without restraint. If there would be danger of being eternally ruined if they were guilty of but one of these acts, what danger is there by such a course in which acts of wickedness are so multiplied and heaped up with such obstinacy and contempt of God's commands and threatenings that cast off fear and restrain prayer before God and go on in ways that they have light enough to know to be evil? If a man in one thought of his heart may provoke God to swear in his wrath, they shall not enter into his rest, Psalm 95.11, and to leave them forever, and, as it were, to resolve never to give them repentance, and even to give them up to hardness of heart and their own heart's lust, that they may live only to fill up the measure of their sins, what danger is there that God will be provoked forever to leave them in sin, and hereafter either to leave to perpetual stupidity, or to deny them place for repentance, so they should seek it carefully with tears? 
How do such persons even dally with the sword of God's wrath? What adventure do they run? They not only stand, but dance upon the very edge of the pit of hell, or are, as it were, running and leaping over the bottomless pit upon nothing but a thin, rotten shell, where they are every moment in danger of dropping through. Such persons do, as it were, venture to pitch battle with God and dare him to do his worst. They run on God when clad in his dreadful armor. Job 15.26 He runneth upon him, even on his neck, and upon the thick bosses of his bucklers. Such persons as these are every day drinking down that deadly poison, the least drop of which is enough to kill them. But here some may make an objection against an allowed wicked course of life, be it that which so exceedingly exposes persons to eternal ruin, that so many such have lately been converted. Tis no uncommon thing for wicked men to harden themselves from the mercy of God. They abuse the riches of God's goodness and forbearance, not knowing that the goodness of God leads them to repentance, and so after their hardness and impenitent heart treasure up wrath against a day of wrath. And so it is likely that some natural persons may forbear themselves with the wonderful exercises and effects of divine mercy that have lately been amongst us, and may be ready to agree within themselves that living in a wicked course of life doesn't to such an exceeding degree expose to eternal ruin, because there are so many amongst us that formerly lived carelessly and went on very ill courses and amongst great light and great warnings with abundant obstinacy. They did not regard anything that was said to them. They were not good examples to others and corrupted the town. And yet they are thought to be converted. Many young people that have been of licentious lives, yea, most of them that were so, are now looked upon to be converted. And many that lived in sin till they were old spent a long life in sin, and yet are now become good folk. And hence they may be ready to think that there is no great danger in a wicked course of life, but they may do so too, and be as likely to be converted as they. But those that make this objection consider the following number one. In the time of the late pouring out of the Spirit, this was not the improvement that persons made of the conversion of great sinners to harden themselves a more in sin because such multitudes were converted, and because great sinners were converted. They did not think within themselves, Will I go on and allow myself in ways of sin because others that have done so? Are so many of them converted? But it had a contrary effect then. They were the more accustomed by it to hear of the conversion of such, that roused them and made them more sensible of the misery of their condition, than their mean condition looked the more dreadful to them for it that they should be left behind when others of all sorts and great sinners among the rest were flocking in. It made them more sensible of their own danger and not less. The hearing of the news of the conversion of such and such, it commonly struck persons into the heart. It struck them down in sorrow from consideration of their own misery. And the hearing of the conversion of such as has been the loosest persons seem to have this effect most. And how comes it to pass has so much of a contrary effect in your mind now that now you are hardened by it and think your danger less for it. The consideration of it instead of awakening you makes you more careless. Number two. There is no just arguing against the exceeding dangerousness of a wicked course of life from what God does in an extraordinary time. We have already affirmed in the doctrinal part that God is sovereign in this manner, and that although he may cast a person off forever for one thought of his heart, that yet he may and sometimes does forgive those that have been great sinners and have spent great parts of their lives. And so God may, in a special and extraordinary day of his grace and mercy, forgive great multitudes of such to show the infiniteness of his grace and mercy. But tis unreasonable arguing from this, that therefore an allowed course of wickedness doesn't greatly expose to it being eternally cast off for of God. What God has of late wrought amongst us is a very extraordinary work of his, in which he has very much gone out of his usual way. The time was extraordinarily such, as is scarcely one in many ages to be heard of and it is exceeding unreasonable for sinners to argue that there is no extreme danger in a wicked course from what has been wrought once in New England, 
in a dispensation that never before had any to parallel, and which is rarely paralleled in history, but it is abundantly manifest and in the way of God's ordinary providence, the far greater part of wicked men perish, especially of them that have long gone on and allowed ways of wickedness against light and much warning, but very few are saved. And it is probable there are thousands and ten thousands of them that are finally left of God. And though there has been such an extraordinary time amongst us, we don't know that ever there will be another such a time. Number three. The danger of them that go on in allowed ways of wickedness amongst us is, upon many accounts, much greater than if there never had been such an extraordinary time of the pouring out of God's Spirit. If you go on and sin after God has so extraordinarily appeared amongst us, your sins will be abundantly the more aggravated than the judgment of God. Matthew 11, verse 23. Thou Capernaum, which has been exalted up unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And such persons, if they are passed over, and persons do notwithstanding continue in allowed sinning, or do return to it, are ever followed with a more dreadful hardness and obduriteness of heart, and a more extraordinary and the more precious the opportunities and advantages men have had, the worse is the case, and the more exceeding dangerous if they continue in allowed wickedness of life. So if you are one that is now going on in sin, you had not need to harden yourself in your carelessness and wickedness by the great and extraordinary things that have happened, for it looks vastly the more awfully upon you on that account. This is mentioned as one great reason why God swore in his wrath that the children of Israel should never enter into his rest, because they had seen such wonderful and glorious works of God for Israel, and yet continued in sin is Numbers 14, 21 to 23. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. The sin that Simon the sorcerer was guilty of, that is spoken of in the text, that probably was never forgiven, but provoked God eternally to cast him away, was committed at a time when God had been wonderfully working in the town that he belonged to by the pouring out of his spirit, which was one great aggravation of his sin that rendered it fatal to his soul. Inference number three. Hence we may learn how wonderful and infinitely great God's mercy has been to them who have all their sins forgiven them that those that have been the subjects of such mercy amongst us, whom God has looked upon with a gracious eye and called them to the city of refuge, consider what exceeding mercy they have been the subjects of. For if it be so that a person may undo himself eternally by one thought of the heart, then how often you have done that that has been sufficient eternally to undo you? How many thousands, yea, ten thousands of times? How have you gone on in sin in times past, and added one sin to another, and multiplied your transgressions as if you had a mind to make sure of being effectually undone? The God of his sovereign and distinguishing grace and mercy has delivered you from that ruin you deserve and exposed yourselves to. He has quite delivered you and set you in a state of perfect safety from it. He has quite covered all your sins, not only your wicked thoughts of heart, but your wicked words and all your wicked actions and wicked practices with all their aggravations. They are effectually blotted out. God has done with them. Christ's blood has made an end of them, and God has buried them in the depths of his mercy. And though you are still a sinful creature, and do those things every day and a hundred times a day that deserve eternal undoing, yet God doesn't behold iniquity nor see perversion in you, but kindly covers all with the white and glorious robes of the righteousness of your Redeemer. You have undone yourselves, and undone yourselves as it were thousands of times, but God would not suffer you to be eternally undone, for he loved you with an everlasting love, and he would love you. Therefore it is that you are not cast off forever, but on the contrary are saved with an everlasting salvation. He has washed you in Christ's blood, Romans 8, verse 39. Who is he that condemneth? And there is none who can ever separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. 
neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. And you were advanced through true grace to an eternal glorious inheritance. Thus has God magnified his mercy towards you, and such cause has he given you to love him and magnify his name. Your guilt has doubtless been much greater than that of many with whom God has been provoked by their sins forever to depart from and leave them in sin, and in hardness and blindness, and to damn them at last. But yet thus God has dealt with them, and thus differently has he dealt with you. The second use may be of conviction to convince those sinners that are seeking their salvation that they are entirely in the hands of God with respect to the eternal salvation of their souls. For you have now heard that one thought of the heart is sufficient eternally to undo you. How often you have done enough to provoke God to cast you off and forever to deny you a saving grace, though you seek it never so carefully and with never so many tears. You have sent yourself into the hands of justice many thousands of times. If you had been guilty of but one act of sin, though only in thought, you would be in the hands of justice. God might dispose of you as he pleased, and might justly forever deny you any mercy. How much more, then, have you forfeited all mercy by the multitude of your sins? This may convince you that how much soever you need mercy, and how earnestly soever you desire it, and how painfully and diligently soever you have sought it, yet you are wholly in the hands of God. God is under no kind of tie to do anything for you. You have not and cannot lay him under any obligation. The third and last use may be of warning. Number one, in general, with the greatest care and watchfulness to avoid all sin. If a man may undo himself eternally by one act of sin, then surely you had need to dread the commission of any sin. And you may well dread the commission of any one sin more than the greatest temporal evil that can possibly befall you, because all sin is mortal. It is all of an undoing nature. And if you commit that one sin, it may be your eternal remediless undoing. Keep this in mind, and think often what need you have to watch your thoughts and your words and all your actions, that they may not be displeasing to God or contrary to his holy commandments. But number two, let us be more particularly warned from hence to avoid all such acts of sin as do more especially tend everlastingly to ruin the soul. Let us be especially careful to avoid such sins as do especially tend to provoke God to swear in his wrath that we shall never enter into his rest. Beware of committing known sin, for willful acts of sin do more than others expose the soul to remediless ruin. If you that have been careless and negligent of your duty, and have allowed yourself to do that which you had light to know was sinful, consider that if you go on willfully to commit one more act of known sin, you may eternally undo your precious soul. And you don't know if you do it, whether ever God will give you grace to repent, and so bestow pardoning mercy on you. You don't know but that God will, by the next act of willful sin, be provoked forever to withhold the saving influence of his Spirit from you, and thus you will be eternally undone. There will be real danger of it, especially after this warning. Therefore, whatever way of known sin you have been wont to go on in, I do now warn you from God not to dare to go on to one act more. As you would not expose yourself to be forever ruined, I declare to you in the name of God that it will be dreadful to venture that you will run if you do so. Number two, beware of deliberate acts of sin. Number three, beware of being guilty of known sins against great warnings. Proverbs 29.1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Beware of sinning against great warning in the word. Take heed that you don't do those things that you have abundant light set before you about, have been abundantly instructed in the evil of, and often greatly warned against. Beware of sinning against warnings of providence. God won't bear your going on thus always. Number four, be warned especially to beware of such acts of sins in which the Spirit of God is opposed and sinned against. One sin that is against the Spirit of God that is unpardonable is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Other sins against the Holy Spirit, though they are not unpardonable, yet do especially expose the soul to everlasting ruin, because it is by the Spirit alone we can be converted or awakened, or any way delivered from sin or helped against it. And if we sin against this person that should deliver, 
No wonder if we are left without help and without remedy. And no wonder if the Spirit departs from us. And then we shall be given up to hardness and blindness and must necessarily perish forever. The sin that Simon was guilty of was a sin against the Spirit of God. It was his contentious thought of the Spirit of God where he thought the Holy Ghost might be purchased. He offered money that he might have that. He might have the Holy Ghost at his disposal that on whomsoever he laid hands on he may receive the Holy Ghost. There are various ways in which the Holy Ghost is sinned against, every one of which do especially expose to being eternally left of God, committing a known sin at the time when under strivings of the Spirit, quenching the Spirit, backsliding to a way of allowed sinning after we have had convictions of the Spirit, sinning against special convictions above that, in or soon after times of remarkable pouring out of the Spirit in the place where we live. Therefore, as you would not expose yourself to be eternally undone, beware of these ways of sinning. If you have the Spirit of God striving with you, beware. Beware of going on now after God thus has been striving with you. Don't dare to do those things that in the time of conviction you dare not do, that the Spirit of God has once given you convictions of the evil of third and last warning is to beware of wicked thoughts. If a person may be eternally undone in one thought of his heart, then we have great reason hence to take warning to watch over our thoughts and not to allow any wicked thought. Don't indulge any lust so much as in your thoughts. Take heed you don't show yourself in any malicious or revengeful or envious thoughts. Don't indulge a spirit of hatred against your neighbor in your thoughts, and don't indulge a lust of uncleanness or lasciviousness in your thoughts and imaginations. Such wickedness of heart, though only in thought, is heinous in the sight of God, and may eternally undo you. And let those that are under convictions take heed that they don't allow any quarreling or blasphemous or dishonorable thoughts of God. Some do too much allow such thoughts when they have them under a notion that there is no harm in them, but dreadful is their folly. Such thoughts, however, sometimes overruled for good, yet if allowed to do especially, exposed to eternal ruin. Simon Magus, a thought by which he was probably eternally undone, was a dishonorable, blasphemous thought of God. This instance should make everyone dread such things as they would dread the devil himself. Jonathan Edwards, June 1736 Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.